Welcome to Dr. James Cousins Lecture Series on Southern Alberta History recorded in 1974. Today, Talk 9 is about the struggles working towards incorporation. Um, no, I think maybe I'd better get this town incorporated. And I, I'm going to do it quickly because... Now, I suppose that incorporation must have appeared a natural development quite early. But with a large company owning most of the property, it is only natural that the said company would hold out against the formation of a taxing body as long as they could. And even when they gave way, they would try to get their property exempted as a sine qua non of their acceptance. Because I know this because it happened in many company towns that I had to study in, in, in the history of the Cosmas past. So the idea of incorporation had to be approached gradually and carefully to avoid frightening the company. So it wasn't until December the 7th, 1887, that the question was considered seriously. The Gazette had printed an editorial appealing for the incorporation of McLeod. The news then echoed the sentiment by pointing out the advantages of Lethbridge doing the same thing. The taxes that everybody feared, he said, would be no more really than the donations that the people had been giving in the past for community improvement. J.D. Higginbottom, the druggist, wrote a letter suggesting incorporation as a necessity for this town's progress. And anyway, they were bigger than McLeod, and they couldn't let McLeod get ahead of them. You see. As a matter of fact, they didn't, because it was 1891 for Lethbridge and 1893 for McLeod. Well, in February 1888, the editor became so despondent that he temporarily deserted his boost do not knock philosophy and admitted that this can be an awfully muddy place quite often. And this mud gives investors a bad idea of the town. We need sidewalks, he says. Now, some merchants have done this on their own. That is, they put some coal slack in front of their stores. They got it free from the company if they hauled it. But their value was diminished by the gaps in between. And he noted that there were many big mud holes in the vacant lots, and especially at the corner of Round and Red Path Street. Now, that's the heart and nerve center of the great city. The only remedy, he said, was incorporation. But nobody bit, and nobody called a meeting, so nothing happened. Well, in May, Saunders had worked up enough steam to have, it to have a go at it again. And this time he put a great big editorial, and he com commented on one obstacle to incorporation. He said, in most places, subscribers to such causes are local residents. But in towns like this, where so much of the real estate is owned by non-residents, who in no way contribute to supporting the town, the residents should take action to see what advantage incorporation would bring, I suppose by taxing the absentee landlord. But um, Mr. Um, Dan Otter told me that when he looked at the tax rolls here, the number of absentee landowners in Lethbridge was so great that he had to change his whole approach on uh, the golf land owning in Lethbridge and uh, go back and rewrite a big chunk of his thesis. He'd have been finished by now, but he couldn't because of the, the peculiarity of land owning. In, um, in the town of Pullman, Washington, where I attended university, the famous Washington State University, uh, it's best described by the head of the history department down there, who said, Pullman, if the earth should ever be so situated as to need an enema, Pullman would be the place where the tube would be inserted. <laughs> well, that place suffered from absentee landlords, too. People owned stores there. And they retired to California, and they never improved them, and the town was the most run-down looking place you ever saw. Beautiful university, fine buildings all up on the hills there, down in the valley. Oh, boy. We used to go to Moscow. Uh, that's in Idaho. <laughs> and shop or down to Lewiston, Idaho, because you couldn't get anything at a decent price, in, uh, except in, 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 in supermarkets. That was all. It was, uh, that was all. Uh, it's the same old business. But he does bring forth other reasons. For instance, he said, the high cost of water, we should have some sort of water system and we can only get that by incorporation. The high insurance rates, he said they would be reduced by 25% if we had a fire department. He's given up on uh, the hook and ladder brigade. <laughs> they kind of let him down. The fear of taxes can be cleared away by realizing that the high cost of water and the high cost of insurance are really taxes no matter what one calls them. So you see, my children, he's really laying it on this. Well, by August the 22nd, some steps must, be, must have been taken because the editor gave words of praise on the progress, 
However, the fact was that there were no regulations, he said, against rotting carcasses and other garbage rotting in the center of town. Boy, he was getting smelly, wasn't he? In fact, he said, many who formerly opposed incorporation because of the fear of taxes have changed their minds because of the terrible state of this town. Well, he then dealt with what must have been the biggest stumbling block, the company, without whose permission nothing could be done. And he says this, We are glad to hear that Mr. E. T. Gall fully recognizes the necessity of incorporating the town and heartily favors it so long as the company lands on the north side of the railroad are not included in the boundary. Just remember that for a moment, because when I come around, you'll see something different happen. Sounder stated that the boundary should be extended from Section 31, Township 8, Range 21, to Section 32. The town should also have a river frontage to protect the water supply. And at the meeting called, to, now here's the interesting thing of how it was done. They called a meeting to decide how to spend the grant of $391 that had been given to them by the Northwest Territories Council. And then, at that meeting, they formed another committee uh, consisting of McKillop, Craig, Higginbottom, <coughs> Saunders, McCall, and Connie Bear to look into incorporation. And then there was a long silence uh, from August the 22nd, 1888 until June the 26th, 1889, when Mr. Saunders stated that Lethbridge should be incorporated because there was no body to advertise for settlers like the other towns do. At least lepers could form a board of trade as they had at McLeod or Medicine Hat. So you see, he's uh, getting after them again. You know what would you do without the newspaper? Uh, well, in September 1889, the occasion of the Governor General's visit called into being a committee to arrange a, sep a reception for him. The citizens then availed themselves of the opportunity at the same meeting to form a board of trade or civic committee. One, to greet the Governor General, and two, to discuss incorporation. <laughs> they, they drag it in by the tail always. There's always the, at one meeting they discuss something else. You remember they were going to open the school and they decided to have a graveyard, form a committee to do the graveyard. Well, at a meeting on September the 19th, with Mr. Champness in the chair, Mr. Champness was the collector of customs at that time, it was decided that McCall, Gallagher, and McGrath should draft the address of welcome and form a decoration committee, and Kavanaugh, Champlin, Dean, Duff, Gallagher, Greenwood, McGrath, McCall, McKillop, and Stafford should work on another committee, uh, a citizens committee, at a future date to incorporate the town of Lefty. <coughs> they decided also to form a board of trade and appoint officers next Thursday. Well, this was done when Mr. C.A. McGrath was president, and T. Curry was vice president, and Mr. Gallagher was secretary, and Mr. George W. Lafferty was the treasurer, and uh, a committee of Kavanaugh, Coltman, Hawley, McNabb, Martin, and Bentley, all familiar names by now. You know, I know all of these fellows exactly what they did for a living, even, from reading uh, Mr. So-and-so is the accountant at the company um, mines, and this fellow is the accountant at the bookstore, and uh, the, uh, the, the bookkeeper at the sawmill or something like that. Well, in January, Mr. Uh, editor is saying, why is the Board of Trade not meeting monthly? They didn't meet in November or December. And so he suggested what you might call the 19th century equivalent of get with it, boys. So after having chastised them like that for not meeting two months in a row, they decided to, <laughs> to meet. And finally, they met in April. <laughs> <laughs> Takes a while. Now that's a big town. To draft the limits of the town. Now I'm going to turn to another source, and that's Mr. McGrath's papers. Now this motion from the meeting of April the uh, from the Board of Trade, April the 17th, 1890, moved by Martin and seconded by Mr. Higginbottom that the Executive Committee draft a scheme of incorporation. Well, the news got after them again in May. Time is slipping by, O Chamber of Commerce. What have you done about incorporation lately? Nothing. It is absurd that this town of 1,500 people should be without municipal government. Hurry, because the Northwest Territories Council meets in October. So they met in May. The, uh, May the 31st. That the boundaries of the proposed town be the river on the west, the road allowance immediately west of Mr. Scott's place on the east, the southern boundary of section 31 produced on the south, and the north boundary and the south half of section 6 produced on the north. I, I've got it drawn in here, and I want to show you what they did. Um, let's see, I'm going to draw the river across here like that. And there's a section along here, and another one along here, another one along there. And then over here, another one, something like that. 
So you put down this like this, and you've got section 12 there, and you've got 36 there, and there shouldn't be anything there, the river comes in there. <laughs> I haven't got a number in that one. You've got then section 30 here, and 29 here, and 31 there, and 32 there. If you know how sections, these aren't wrong, these are right, you've got to count them right, that's all. Uh, and, uh, and then there's 12, 6, and that's 5. Now, when they drew their boundary, they went down like this. On the outside of 32, 29, to there. And then they cut across right here, halfway. Now this is uh, what he called, uh, um, McGrath called his Plan A. Now, the railway on the company ran about there, right on the north of that line. So that this area, which was going to be incorporated in the, into town, would include all the mines, even the number three uh, shaft that was going in, and all their sheds and all their boarding houses on the north side of the track. That's rather interesting because the company had wanted to keep all that out, and the first plan, uh, they weren't going to go north of section uh, 31 and 32 there. Now, I've got the townships and ranges in here. I just copied this from, from the papers. And uh, so they accepted this plan A, and then later somebody suggested that this uh, section 5 should also be included. Uh, this map here is supposed to be 1890, uh, obviously is after incorporation because uh, in here, they show where they have subdivided and named the streets in here and up in here. Well, that, this is the original city there. And uh, this one says, sections 31 and 32, the subdivision of part of these sections, Township 8, Range 21, west of the 4th Meridian. And uh, it's rather interesting, the names of the streets along here. Um, no, it's, it's this way. They named them after the people of the town. That's why you know it wasn't done before. And there's, they must have named them after their wives because they've got Bertha Street, Sylvia Street, Emily Street, Peter Street, Mary Street, and then they have Kingbury, and then they have Louise and Teplo, and then William Street and Ernest Street, and then back to... But uh, that must have been done after this thing. Well, now the question then is, what about their promise not to tax the uh, mine property. Well, they agreed, Bentley and Curry, on a motion to limit the town as Plan A. The limit of the rate of assessment, including a local and special tax, but not including school taxes in any one year, should not exceed one and one quarter cents on the dollar. That's 12 and a half mills. And then in, on June the 20th, this minute, that the north half of Section 5 be included. And then Bentley and McNabb that the municipality have no power to grant bonuses. And in the following two minutes are the only signs of a struggle of the company to avoid taxation. Uh, the news had reported that the committee had a chat with Mr. Galt and had uh, uh, arranged it. But here's the first minute. Uh, by Bentley and Curry, these are not company men, that the coal shafts, workshops, engine houses, and rolling stock, as asked by Mr. Galt, be exempt from municipal tax, but not from school tax. And then the very next minute, that the term of exemption be set at 20 years. You know, you could almost see the struggle there between the merchants and, and the mining company. Two simple little minutes. You, you have no idea of how these fellows were taking a chance that the company would say, all right, boys, you'll get no business from us, or we'll boycott you, or we'll do something. As a, well, uh, I can give you an example of what happened in Coleman. Uh, the school board in Coleman decided to build a school. This was in 1935, which wasn't a very prosperous period. And uh, the manager of the mine um, was very angry at one of his uh, officials for supporting this. He, he was chairman of the school board. And he didn't fire him, but he had been given a house by the powerhouse rent-free, with light and water free. So they very quietly charged him rent and charged him light and water for disobeying instructions not to build that school in Coleman. Well, this is the sort of thing these fellows were taking a chance on when, uh, and I, uh, you can back me up on that, Mr. Reed in Carbondale, and, and uh, uh, this is evidence, this isn't gossip, and uh, George Kellock was the fellow who did it, who done it. Uh, 
Well, um, so they did get that. Taxation would only be for two years. Now notice that uh, uh, they're going to limit their taxes to 12 and a half mills. And uh, they were going to, I, I think I have something on that, if I haven't. Well, yes, I have an explanation of it down here. On June the 25th, 1890, the news noted that a public meeting explaining the plan would be held before the plan was sent to Regina. And on July the 9th, the editor announced the area to be incorporated was too small to meet the requirements of the municipal ordinance, but the Board of Trade arranged for a poll on September the 19th where anyone on the public or separate school board lists could vote. They explained that the 12 and a half mil limit was, being, was less than the 20 mil limit which the ordinance had provided. And that while the town could not give bonuses to industry, neither would it enter into milling or other enterprises because other towns had got into difficulty on both of these things. And it's rather interesting that uh, the city of Lethbridge didn't crib itself in that way at all. So that when Ellison Mills came here, uh, the city was able to give bonuses and grants to encourage Ellison Mills to set up in Lethbridge. Uh, uh, one of my former students uh, did a, a work on this, and he was been promising to give me a copy, and I haven't seen it. It's a very fine work on milling in southern Alberta. Well, the poll was held on July the 19th, but for some reason or other, there's a complete report signed by Alex Moffat on dated July the 18th. <laughs> Must have put the wrong date down. Um, of 1890. There was no secret ballot, and the name of the voter was marked with his decision. There were 75 names. That's about one-third of the eligible voters. Some of the miners didn't vote because they couldn't get off from work. There was no law there compelling so many hours for voting. You can see the reason for some of these laws. But uh, the result was, he had a big long list of all the names of the people who voted, and after their name would be yay or nay. Well, there were 68 yay votes, and there were six nay votes, and one said, I won't vote, so they put won't vote down. Um, well, Mr. C.A. McGrath became mayor by acclamation on February the 2nd of 1891, and uh, uh, it was passed by the council on November the 26th, 1890, and proclaimed on January the 15th, 1891. Now, I want to show you something interesting. If you want to go into politics, be sure to change your name to uh, have a letter higher than H in the alphabet. Because they always say that people uh, run out of votes before they get down past H. Here's an example of it. Here is the list of voters alphabetically. Notice that out of uh, there are six of them. One, two, three, four, five are up to H. Turner down here must have been pretty important. Uh, he was number four. But the rest of them are all lumped up there. Bentley got 207, Cavanaugh 223, Coltman got 169, and W. Henderson, Lethbridge House. Uh, w. Anderson prop, west of the square, and that's him, 140, and those are the ones who are elected. And uh, it's rather interesting that Malcolm McKenzie ran for council, and he was one of the nay votes. He didn't want the incorporation. Uh, well, Mr. McGrath was mayor for one year, then he resigned when he became MLA, and in the following election, the nay voter, Mr. Malcolm McKenzie, was elected to council. And then McLeod in 1893 finally dropped the word fort and became what everybody had always been calling it, McLeod. So this is how our town got going.